I believe that we are live. Let's see. Test one, two, three. One, two, three. Test one, two, three. We're good to go. As always, this is not legal advice. We do not offer legal advice. This is for entertainment, educational, and informational purposes only. If you are seeking legal advice, please reach out to, reach out to your licensed attorney. Um, welcome back to part nine. I think, funny enough, this is going to end up being ten parts. Which is cool because um, we wanted to break it up, um, not make it too long. 45 minutes was the max I was trying to shoot for um, on all of the parts. But um, I think we did a good job with that for the most part um, so that they could be listened to in, in attention spans that are more suited for the modern day learner, even though a lot more uh, of those attention spans are shorter. Um, but, anywho, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, just trying to make sure I was in the right spot from last time. Um, I can't remember if I did this. Keeping minutes. I guess we were on minutes. Okay. Man, it's been a while. But yeah, we'll probably finish up with one more part after this. Um, I mean, I don't know. Who knows? We might get done tonight. It just depends on how many complicated terms there are um, that we got to dive into. But um, coming up next, actually, I'll show you guys. You guys can... Um, you guys can look this up yourself, free business trust manual, PDF, we'll be doing that, but before we get to that, we'll probably do a read through, probably more than one part, sorry, probably only one part, maybe two, of the, um, of the, um, Hale versus Hinkle landmark case. Um, that kind of talks about public and pi private um, more than more than um, anything else in uh, case law kind of talks about gives some really good tidbits. So I wanted to cover that to help give a better understanding on public versus private and really break that down. If it's going to be an hour, I'll just do an hour. I won't break it up into two parts, maybe. Um, but I don't know. I haven't decided that. Yeah, I'm just trying to take this one day at a time. Um, but with that being said. Let's jump into this. Um, as always, like, share, subscribe, follow us on Instagram, govern dot according. Sorry, govern dot yourself dot accordingly. Share with your friends. Um, using this as a platform to help people understand how to operate in the private, how to start getting started, how to start getting work. Gosh, I can't talk tonight. All right, let's start this over. How to start operating out of trust um, and do so in a way that uh, not only limits their liability. Um, but mitigates their tax uh, taxes legally, even though we do not offer financial or legal advice. Um, and amongst a myriad of other benefits, such as privacy, uh, wealth management, wealth security, et cetera, et cetera. So that being said, keeping minutes. As mentioned earlier, it is the duty of the trustee to keep minutes for all resolutions, decisions, and acts done in the administration of the trust. This is a form of accounting and may suffice as the accounting. However, it is recommended that some separate, more detailed accounting always be kept. If you don't know how to do accounting on your own, hire an accountant. That is my suggestion to you. Because it's just about handling your affairs. Um, and really quick tidbit, um, anytime that I'm looking up anything, this is the reason why I did this. Because I want, not only did I want to go through this information, but I also wanted to help people understand how to learn how to comprehend a certain topic. So when we talk about trust, this year, sorry, this time last year, 
I had I didn't have, I knew nothing about dress. N- next to nothing. I knew a little bit, but nothing crazy. But it took me f- going in, typing in things, and and learning the definition word by word, yeah. and marinating on them, so that I could further my understanding. And now a year later. I know a lot of this stuff like the back of my hand. In business law, memoranda or notes of a transaction or proceeding. Thus, the record of proceedings at a meeting of directors or shareholders of a company is called the minutes or trustee. That, that applies there as well. So, let's say I have 10 minutes in my meeting. I'm not... Saying that not saying, but just like let's say I have 10 bullet points, each bullet point is likely going to be a minute for you. Um, if that makes sense, continuing, it is generally best to keep minutes of every board of trustees meeting based upon the notes or report taken during the meeting, or if there is only one trustee for the trust on a decision to decision basis. How often and by what protocol minutes are kept is, of course a matter of the trustee's discretion. The rule of thumb is that at least one board of trustees meeting regarding general business or the status of the trust should be held and the minutes kept annually. They should probably be held and kept at least quarterly in conjunction with all other accounting. They suggest quarterly because it just helps you stay up to date on affairs and that way you're not waiting a whole calendar year before trying to like Go find, well, what do we do with this? Why do we do this? Et cetera, et cetera. Stay on top of your task. And they, and they, they provide um, a template for minutes as well. It doesn't have to be anything perfect, but bookkeeping, CYA. Um, but it's not even about CYA because they should never be able to pierce your trust. It's more so just helping you be organized. And, and, and it helps you not be lax in your affairs either. We all were called to be through spiritual law, whether you believe in the creator of heaven or not, um, we're called to be diligent. We're called to be uh, attentive uh, to the little details. And, and keeping minutes is a part of that. Continuing. The more often the accounting, the more up-to-date, accurate, and reliable the records in administering trust business. Everything the trustee does should be clearly reflected in the minutes, which can be kept using any word processing software, or even a typewriter. Typewriter, what? (laughs) What? (laughs) Okay. The minutes are stored in succession succession in the minutes book section of the trust binder. I've provided samples of minutes for various acts and resolutions by the board of trustees. The format and core language is always the same or similar. So pretty straightforward. Prevailing in legal matters. This is the good stuff. Here is where we shall get into legal action. The rare instance of public legal affairs, such as determining tax liability, defending a court action instituted against the trust or trustee, and prosecuting a legal action on behalf of the trust or trustee, as well as the possible necessity of commencing a private action pursuant to the commercial process. The reader must keep in mind that the chances of an action being taken against the trust or trustee who has properly limited his liability are slim to none. We talked about this in an earlier part, but you have to be born literally yesterday and put in the, the position of trustee that same day to, be, to make, it, make yourself liable um, to suit. And if an action is taken against them anyway, generally, such cases don't make it past the crucial phase of determining jurisdiction. When one examines the definition of jurisdiction, the fog begins to clear. So let's go look at it because I'm telling you, this is this is it. If there is anything that you need to perk your ears up on, it is this. Um, Let me see. Let's see, where are we at? Want of jurisdiction, special jurisdiction, original. I just want the word jurisdiction in and of itself. Of course, it's going to take some years to get to it. It's been 84 years. (laughs) 
Ah, there we go. The power and authority constitutionally conferred upon or constitutionally recognized as existing in a court or judge to pronounce the sentence of the law or to award the remedies provided by law upon a state of facts proved or admitted referred to the tribunal for decision and authorized by law to the subject of investigation or action by that tribunal and in favor of or against persons or a thing res who present themselves or who are brought before the court in some manner sanctioned by law as proper and sufficient so what is that saying in layman's terms basically the court's authority to basically make a judgment or submit an order or ruling against or for someone Why is that important? I'm going to get into it. I don't, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I don't like the graphs they have in here. So I'm going to go through them as well as I possibly can because it's a little weird. But I'm going to explain this in a way that I know how to explain this best without confusing anyone. So bear with me. That's the definition right here. A, ge a, a government's general power to exercise authority over all persons and things. Remember what persons means from part one. Within its territory, New Jersey's jurisdiction, a court power to decide a case or issue a decree. Like, New Jersey can't make a, um, a ruling over, um, I don't know, Tennessee, if that makes sense. Not unless... There's some stipulations that have to happen. Let me see. I will pull this video up and play it all for this YouTube because I want you guys to know this. I want you guys to know this, and this explains it very well. So they kind of give it to us. Oh my gosh, not this sovereign citizen stuff. I don't want this stuff. Do not want this. This is not what we're looking for. If not, I'll come back later to it, but. Um. Okay. Hey, that's us. <laughs> hey, look at us. We made it, Mom. We made it. Look at us. Let's go. <laughs> no, I'll come back to it later. Okay. Okay. A geographical area within which political or judicial authority may be exercised. A political or ju ju sorry, judicial subdivision within such an area. So like a smaller area within that political area. So like the city of Cincinnati is in the jurisdiction of Ohio. I really want to find that video. Ah, oh, man. That's going to bug me. That's not what I want. <laughs> That's not what I want at all. No. This guy does a really, really good job of explaining jurisdiction. And, um, um, shout out to this guy, by the way. This is where I got my idea to start this read through from. I hope they're doing all right. Um, um, it's not what I want, though. Um, All right, sorry, I don't want to spend too much time. I'll probably I'll probably post the video to my page, um, here in the couple next couple of days, because when you understand jurisdiction, 
all of this stuff, I promise you, it will clear up exponentially. Exponentially. Like, exponentially. It, it does, like, it, it completely clears the entire picture. So that's why I told you I'm going to explain it in the way that I know how to, and then I'll try to go through the graphs as well. So, there are two territorial jurisdictions created by the Constitution. The first is the territory, 162, which says, Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2, in reference to the incorporated Union of States, or states incorporated under Clause 1 of the same section. The Articles of Confederation, Confederation were also incorporated into the Constitution under Clause 1, and the Union of States is also incorporated under the Articles of Confederation. By reference, this quote-unquote other party is known as a territory. Both the territory and other property signify property, since the language in that section is not the territory or property. The, other, the operative word is other. Other property. Therefore, other property must be interpreted to mean a territory as in a governmental subdivision, which happened to be called a territory, but which could have been called a province, colony, etc. It refers to an incomplete state. I read through all of that, but keep on going. There are two territorial jurisdictions created by the Constitution. The first is the territory, i.e., that, that designated portion of the Earth's surface, which is deemed the imperial extensive real estate holdings of the nation over which all power must be exercised with the strict letter of the Constitution. This is talking about the land. Remember, law of the land is private. Keep it going. The law of the sea is admiralty maritime, which is derived from statutes. Um, keep it going. The second is the other property. A territory unincorporated, not included, into this union of states. That's a bad word to use there, unincorporated, because that makes you think that it's private, but it's not in this sense. So bear with that right there. Over which all power may be exercised strictly according to the mere spirit of the Bill of Rights as interpreted, interpreted by Congress. And as we, we know from the earlier parts, Congress is a public entity creating public laws to govern the public. The latter is subject to Congress outside the strict letter of guarantees of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. In the former, the federal government can have no direct control over the people, but by way of contract, because it is entering onto every scene equally subject to the same laws as all persons as opposed to the latter, wherein the federal government can have full and direct control over people who are beneficiaries of this jurisdiction. As noted earlier, they may act as they see fit, as trustees, for the benefit of the public policy regulations known as codes and statutes of this jurisdiction. So now you're starting to see the structure of the United States, 164, just a case law. So... This is to break down the, let's just break down the public. I'm going to explain this to you. So, going back up. So you have the United States government. That is the trust. Let's just say that's the trust for now. It's a corporation, but let's, it's a public trust as well. The United States government is the trust. You are the beneficiary as a United States citizen because you are receiving benefits and privileges in the form of a driver's license, in the form of food stamps, welfare, um, insurance, that you are receiving those benefits from the United States. Why do you think they gave you a number to then access those benefits? That social security number is not yours. It is theirs, but you are using it as a benefit to receive something from them. And the people that manage those benefits and give them out are public officials, whether it be judges, whether it be people that work at the DMV, whether it be um, lawyers, police officers, policy officers, all of these things. I'm going to make sure that everyone understands this because it's not common knowledge. 
everything is trust law, everything is contract law, everything's structured as such, because trusts are, in essence, contracts. So that's just to give you the understanding of how our system is working. When you decide to accept the benefits of this public jurisdiction, you are now, as a United States, United States citizen, operating in the public. And now you're setting yourself up to be um, liable because if, then if something happens, then they, they take you from the they take you from the chair of beneficiary and then they stick you in the in the chair of trustee. That's why you're a co-beneficiary, co-trustee of the public charitable trust. But let's keep going. Hope I explained that right. Whereas we talk about, let's talk about the private before I go on. You know, let's talk about that because I made the prob public one. So you have the United States of America Republic. Constitution for the United States. That is the private United States, the landmass private, meaning not governed by the Congress. That is the trust. The trustees of that um, really, you know, well, that's a tough one. It can, it can go both ways. You know, it, I th it's more, so, it's, that's the thing. It's more so the same. Obviously, you can say the states are like the states as land masses are the same, but it, it's more so that it it's the same. The difference is is how you're operating and what set of rules you're bound by, and when you're a trustee and when you are um, a beneficiary. Which really, there's no, there really shouldn't be too many times that you are a beneficiary. You might benefit from operating in the private, but it doesn't me necessarily mean that you are a beneficiary. Don't don't those two things are um, mutually mutually um, not mutually inclusive all the time. So I hope that makes sense. So it's a little bit of the same for both, but it's just a matter of which one you're operating in, because the benefits of the the public are bad benefits. They're not really things that you want to have because they are the things that are tearing our country apart. But continuing. Understanding that most courts currently in business in America are in fact by the 1938 change in the operation of law, courts of limited jurisdiction. Such courts are defined as having jurisdiction that is confined to a particular type of case and may exercise only under statutory limits and prescription, also called special jurisdiction. Article 1 courts, if you didn't know that. A court that has the power to handle certain cases that are specified by law and is called a court of special jurisdiction. Article 1 court. Courts of limited jurisdiction, limited to cases involving subject matter of the 14th Amendment, public trust. What did I just talk about? I didn't even remember. I didn't remember this was coming up, but perfect timing. It becomes clear that whether they are distinguished as federal or state courts, such is a distinction without a fundamental difference. All are inherently federal. In order to get at how such courts may obtain jurisdiction over an express trust or its trustees in a legal action, the nature of jurisdiction should be briefly but su sufficiently examined. First, a court must have three, essential, uh, three essentials. Jurisdiction to determine jurisdiction. <laughs> jurisdiction over the subject matter of the case. It must have the power or competence to decide the con kind of controversy involved. And jurisdiction over the parties to the case personal jurisdiction or personum jurisdiction to compel the party's performance. If either one is lacking in any way, the court is without power to decide the case and any order, decree, or judgment other than a dismissal by such a court is void ab initio, meaning from the start. Having only the semblance of appearance of validity and may be attacked directly or collaterally and vacated at any time. It is settled law that a tribunal has jurisdiction to determine its own jurisdiction, which brings us to the remaining two elements. 
let's see, case law, case law, case law, case law, case law. So, before we go upon these, you know what, let's read it because it's going to tell you guys what I'm about to say anyways. Subject matter jurisdiction is like the hub around which the wheel turns. Without the hub, the wheel cannot turn credibly. It's compromised of two, start, two parts, the statutory or common law authority of the court to hear the case, and the appearance and testimony of the competent fact witness, sufficiency of pleadings. Subject matter jurisdiction can never be waived. And it cannot be obtained by lapse of time, consent of the parties, meaning you can't confer subject matter jurisdiction to a court or any event other than the sufficiency of pleadings of the party bringing the suit. However, although it may be, have been established by pleadings, it can still be lost due to inter alia, fraud upon the court, inter alia. I, I need to make sure I'm looking that up. Let me look that up. I, I remember, <sighs> among other things, okay. Yeah, okay. Fraud upon the court, the judge's failure to proper follow proper, proper procedure, and here we go. The unlawful activity of this undisclosed interest, undisclosed conflict of interest of the judge, the court exceeding its statutory authority, violation of due process, and proper presentation of a party, representation of a party before the court, and proper issuance of a summons, or defective service of summons, sorry, service of process, I cannot talk tonight, sorry guys, proper notice not being given to all parties by the movement, the court basing its order or judgment upon a void order or judgment, and violation of a public policy. And when subject matter jurisdiction is lacking or lost, the court must discharge its ministerial duty to dismiss on that ground on its own motion, whether it has personal jurisdiction or not. I'm going to stop for a minute. Because this one is near and dear to my heart. This one is, um... This one is a big one. I've, I've, I, I know this one, like, if there is anything that I know, like, the back of my hand, it is this. Subject matter jurisdiction cannot be waived. It cannot be conferred. Once, once jurisdiction is challenged in a court, it must be proven on the administrative record. And if it is not proven, the court case must be dismissed. So let's just say in order to bring a lawsuit against someone, I have to be a resident of somewhere. Well, a resident is a public term. I'm as a person, I'm as a, sorry, as a living man and living man or woman, I'm not a resident. I'm just walking about living in my soul. I'm not a resident. I don't define myself as a resident. So can they have jurisdiction over me? No, because that is a public thing and I am a private man. They can't have jurisdiction over me and they can't have jurisdiction over my trust if my trust is in the same manner. Case dismissed. But sometimes they might have jurisdiction because of where your trust is located. Let's just say in order to go get divorced in a state, or in order to sue someone in a the state, they have to be there for X amount of months. Let's say they have to be there for eight months. They're there for seven months, four, four weeks, and seven months and 30 days, and they need one more day. Do they have jurisdiction? No. You cannot confer subject matter jurisdiction. It has to be dismissed. These are important things to understand because if they don't have it, they cannot come after you. Now, here's the thing. They're not going to come after you as long as you're operating even remotely in the way that you should. But subject matter jurisdiction is, is, is literally what makes the pot bubble. Um, you can't get anything going without it. They have to have it at the beginning of any court case, whether you're dealing as a trustee with, as a, of a private express trust whether someone's suing you in your person, the first thing you should do, even if they do have it, is challenge jurisdiction. Because one, it's going to buy you more time. This is not legal advice. We do not offer legal advice. This is entertainment, educational purposes only. One, it's going to buy you more time to then get to get yourself together. And then two, it's going to make them prove it. And just let's just say for whatever reason, they do have it. 
but they can't prove that they have it. Case dismissed. See ya. Have a nice day. Sayonara. It's a very, very, very big thing. These things, a let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I've had eight of these things. I've experienced them, and it sucks. I don't anyone ever wondering why I, why we are doing this and why I got into this is because y you watch people get steamrolled and you watch unfair things happen to people around you and to yourself. So you're like, you got two options. And this is why it's important for people to learn this stuff. Because you can either um, lay down and just take it and deal with it and let people walk over you for the rest of your life. Or you can gird up your loins like a man and do what you should. Let's continue. I could go on all night. Given the preceding sections of the Incorporated Banking Association under House, former House Joint Resolution 192 and all of the above regarding the other property nature of the states today, meaning public, it is easy to see why these courts are ipso facto court of limited jurisdiction. That means by the act itself or by the mere fact. Having no jurisdiction over the subject matter of the territory. So all these corporate Article 1 courts have no subject matter jurisdiction over the private, the territory. The private express trust. The only time they can get jurisdiction, essentially what this is boiling down to, the only time they can get jurisdiction of the private express trust is if you give them a third-party interest through playing in their games. But you can remove yourself from that any time. You can dip your toe in as far as you want. But assuming for the same, and even then, it's you have protection. It's so deep. But assuming this for the same of explanation that subject matter jurisdiction did exist, then personal or person, personal and REM things, jurisdiction over the trust and his trustees can only be attained in four ways. by the tr Either by the trustees, let's see what 181 says. And REM against the thing. How does it say against the thing? As though it were a person vested with legal rights. Remember, a person is not a living me hand, man and woman. It is a persona. Go back to part one and watch that over again if you don't understand that. As is the case with proceedings against vessels under maritime law. In such maritime claims, the standards of international shoe regarding fairness and substantial justice that govern in personam actions are applicable. See Schaefer v. Heitner, 1977. It should be noted, however, the much deeper level to in-rim jurisdiction, for instance, that a presumption of, of the in-rim of in-rim jurisdiction must necessarily precede all actions in personam, whether maritime or otherwise. In-rim jurisdiction exists in some form, officially recognized or not, in almost all court of whatever law. It is, in fact, what ultimately empowers courts to exercise personal jurisdiction in a practical sense, because as the maxim goes, possession is nine-tenths of the law. Hence, nowadays, Courts will generally prefer the parties to be represented by counsel, as has traditionally been the practice in actions against vessels, which cannot be otherwise heard in court. Remember in the first or second, third part maybe, where I talked about attorneys? That, that's counsel. Because as an, when, you, when you hire an attorney, this is not legal advice, you hire an attorney, you are Turning over, a turn, turning over your rights. And now you're giving them, you're giving them jurisdiction right then and there. It's, this is what it's telling you that right now. But anyways, personal jurisdiction can only be obtained um, by the trust or trustee's presence. Them or him being served with a copy of the summons and complaint while physically present in the forum jurisdiction. Domicile, 
i.e. residence alone is a basis for exercising jurisdiction. In the case of corporations, domicile is the state in which they are incorporated. And in the case of express trust, the place of their CETUS, their location, their address, essentially. Permission or consent, trustee, either personally or on behalf of the trust, having not been properly served, can nevertheless give the form court permission to exercise jurisdiction. Depending on the act of the trustee, permission can be given well in advance of any lawsuit, and consent can also be implied. And minimum contacts. Having sufficient dealings or affiliations with the forum jurisdiction, which make it reasonable to require the trustee to defend a lawsuit. 184. Under this doctrine, a forum state can legislate that a non-resident motorist using its highways be deemed to have an appointed, sorry, using its highways be deemed to have appointed a local official as its agent to receive service of process in any action growing out of the user of his vehicle. This is a public term, motor vehicle. It's a public term, but just understand that. But the state must have provided actual notice of this to the non-resident motorist beforehand. The obvious questions are whether the trustee is a motorist or a traveler. Public, private. Whether the conveyance is a vehicle, remember, public, or automobile, private. Whether the trustee is driving or traveling, public, private. And what exactly are the actual physical and metaphysical territorial limits of the jurisdiction? These are fundamentals to, these are fundaments to jurisdiction, which may only be bypassed with the express or implied permission of the party to be charged. So basically what it's saying at the end here is they can only be bypassed when the person who is being sued is waiving that jurisdiction. You can waive personal jurisdiction. You can't waive subject matter jurisdiction. And that's important to realize. Um, I think I looked this up before in an earlier part, but I wanted to find it. Um, it's important to realize this because, again, at the beginning of anything, doesn't matter how much you think they are, don't do anything. Don't, the minute you submit a response of pleading to any lawsuit that is not a challenge of jurisdiction, you have waived personal jurisdiction. You make them earn that. You make them earn it. Do not submit a pleading or anything. You challenge jurisdiction with a notice of special appearance. That's the first thing you should do. The very first thing you should do. Or limited appearance, it's called in some places. You gotta be joking me. Don't 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 mess with me. Do not mess with me. You're trying to make me look stupid now. Alright. I know what a freaking limited appearance is. I study I I there are nights I didn't sleep because I'm studying this stuff. Since they want to play me stupid. Right from the Cornell freaking website. Special appearance is a tool defendants can use to challenge a court's jurisdiction over them. If a court does not have personal jurisdiction or there are other errors like, like for service of process, many states allow defendants to challenge a lawsuit without submitting to a court's jurisdiction. Normally, if the sentence were citizen or make were to make a general appearance the jurisdiction issue would be waived for personal jurisdiction for federal courts in some states a defendant does not have to make a special appearance they are required to challenge a given error before addressing the actual claim itself as one would in a general appearance special appearance may also refer to other unique appearances by an attorney or individual such as an attorney appearing before being assigned to the case 
I would never rely on an attorney with for that. I'm sorry. I went to an attorney one time and I told them I wanted to challenge jurisdiction. They said fifty thousand dollars. I said, you know what? You just started my villain origin story. <laughs> I'm so serious. I want it all, and this is why I know what I know now. This is exactly why I know what I know now. So, you have this complicated graph. It kind of breaks it down a little bit. Let me see how much more we have left of this. These are maxims of law. We'll probably get to that tonight. Maybe. We might not. But two types of jurisdiction. Territorial and then subject matter jurisdiction. Personal jurisdiction. Subject matter jurisdiction. It, this can never be waived. Never. Excuse me, sorry. I'm oh, sorry. There was still more to that. Which, having sufficient dealings or affiliations with the forum jurisdiction which make it reasonable to require the trust or trustee to defend a lawsuit brought in the forum state. If, a trust, if the state has no context, ties, Relations with the trust or trustees, personal jurisdiction cannot be obtained in this manner. The four principles of minimal contacts are the trust or trustees' activity must be continuous and systematic, and the forum jurisdiction and the cause of action must be related to the activity. So let's say I'm driving a motorcycle through the state of Arkansas, and I've been doing that every single day, and I finally hit somebody. I am now, I, they can come after me for minimum contacts. If I was just driving through the state one time and um, I didn't do anything, I didn't hit anyone, but they tried to sue me for something else because I was in the state. They can't do that. That makes sense. Sporadic or casual activity of the trust or trustee in the formal jurisdiction does not justify the exercise of jurisdiction in a cause of action unrelated to the activity. If the trust or trustee's contacts are sufficiently substantial and of such a nature as to make the exercise of jurisdiction reasonable, that word is a funny one in, in law, then general jurisdiction may be exercised by the forum over the trust or trustees. And if the trust or trustee's activity is sporadic or consists only of a single act, then specific jurisdiction may be exercised by the forum only when the cause of action arises out of that activity or act. So these are the four ways by which essentially they can um, they can get minimum contact personal jurisdiction. But there's other ways for them to get personal jurisdiction as well, which, whether it be presence, domicile, or permission. They don't have to have all of them. They only need to have one of those. That's why personal jurisdiction needs to be challenged from the jump. You make them prove it. Um, uh, so let's go back up to this graph. So four ways to obtain the personal jurisdiction. We have that. Minimum contacts. And then... How they can get those minimum contacts, essentially. I'm not going to go through this. I was going to, but it, like it's a little... I don't like the way that this is broken down. I really don't. Um, you can waive... You can give them personal jurisdiction, as it says here. Permission. And then presence, as well. But this is the big one. You should, you should always challenge this one first. And then challenge that one right after. Literally. Notice of special appearance. You guys saw it. I didn't make it up. It's right here. Right on the law website. It's not a fake website. It's real. This stuff is real. Continuing. <sighs> Unlike subject matter jurisdiction, once personal jurisdiction is obtained, it can rarely be lost. And if the trust or trustee permits or makes an unrestricted appearance, it cannot later be denied. Contrary to the general appearance, which constitutes consent. The trust... Man, it's crazy. It's like I know this stuff. 
Now, I knew this way before I read this document, but the trust or the trustees may avoid personal jurisdiction by making a special or restricted appearance for the purpose of attacking the forum court's personal jurisdiction and may even attack, so to speak, subject matter jurisdiction. Generally, a challenge to subject matter jurisdi jurisdiction consent constitutes consent, a waiver of personal jurisdiction for the purpose of argument, but this doctrine does not apply to cases involving express trust over which the subject matter jurisdiction does not exist. So this is why I said attack personal jurisdiction first. Hope that makes sense. Now, a challenge to the subject matter jurisdiction of the court where it is clear on the face of the record that subject matter jurisdiction is lacking is not cons inconsistent with a challenge to the personal jurisdiction. Moreover, since the court must dismiss on its own motion, an appropriate challenge to the subject matter jurisdiction aids the court in performing its duty. The defendant should therefore be allowed to point out lack of subject matter jurisdiction without making a general appearance. It's to the contrary, but it has been cr often criticized and overruled. Mm, okay. Anyways, challenge personal jurisdiction first. I would always challenge personal first. That's just be safe because that's the one that, that you can give away the easiest. You can't give away subject matter jurisdiction. <laughs> Upon further analysis of the preceding diagram, we see that the following. Presence. The trust, and bear with me, we're almost done here. Um, the trust is created and functioning in the territory, a.k.a. the land, the private, doing business under the general common law, not the private law of the unincorporated banking association. Until you actually go and get a banking account, that's different then. Presence can therefore only be construed to exist where the trust has become a member of that association via residence in a revenue district indicated by zip code or by engaging in a particular transaction. Even then, the trust or trustees may, must be present by membership or transaction in that particular political subdivision, state, capital S state, and given notice reasonably certain to reach them. Service of process via either personal service, substituted service, or constructive service. As service by mere publication in a newspaper or general circulation has been held insufficient in such cases. And as a side note, mere physical presence in a courtroom during some phase of or proceeding does not constitute an appearance. I know this from experience. It's a good one. Too. So basically what it's saying is essentially like as long as um basically like your presence in the public like if your private express trust is not doing business in the public then they can't have jurisdiction over you in the public now if I decide to go get a bank account they can have jurisdiction to a small degree not completely it doesn't completely expose you but it only exposes you to the limit that you want to be exposed in, in that game remember if you play in their game you have to follow their rules to a certain degree but you still get to keep a lot of the protections that you have of yours as well domicile the cetus of the trust is in the united states of america the private the constitutional republic not the united states corporation designated the territory the union of the states as the land of which the common law is a supreme law. Unless the trustees, in behalf of the trust, adopts a principal place and the other property, the corporate states, establishes a resident in a place subject to the federal jurisdiction with the intention to make it its domicile, personal jurisdiction is lacking in this respect. It must purposely establish an address directly in a revenue district via post office box or street address to be liable in this way. But if the trustees contracts with a private mail service provider or carrier signing without prejudice, then personal jurisdiction does not attach. This affects any exclusion of any third-party intervener and reserves the obligation to the course of the common law of contracts. Basically saying, stay, don't, you shouldn't use a zip code. What was the word I wanted to look up? Address. 
because it doesn't mean what everyone thinks it does, but essentially it's a very it's a very statutory term. Especially when we're talking about permanent address. A place of business or residence. Mailing address is a lot different from permanent address, as you see that on some some governmental forms. But essentially, don't you're not addressed in the in the other um, properties. You are you are your domicile is in the private. Again, just making that understanding. So your presence, your, your the main place where your trust is located is in the private United States of America. Not using a zip code or whatever you want to call it. Um, if you have to put your zip code in brackets, it's a four corners rule. The judge can't see it. Um, but if you don't want to put it on there, don't put it on there. Um, how much more we got left? Just a little bit. Okay, we're going to finish permission and minimum contacts. And then that, and then we'll go into these maxims. Next, we'll go to the maxims, maintaining good relations and conclusion, and we'll be done. Yeah, this is our second to last part. Um, it may seem tricky, but it is rather simple. Any answer to presentment from a form jurisdiction constitutes giving them permission to exercise authority unless it is specifically a special or restricted appearance for the sole purpose of challenging their authority. This is stuff we've already talked about. If the trustees do not answer in general or subordinate themselves, then consent has not been given. That is not 100% true. And if the trustees presumably under properly limited liability, enter into a contract under a form selection clause, then the form selected will have a per have personal jurisdiction. However, there are limitations to what constitutes an enforceable form clause, or if the clause is expressed in fine print, placed in the contract so as to avoid litigation, and reasonable or ambiguous, not fundamentally fair, or if the clause could not have been disputed without impunity as a part of a freely negotiated contract, then it is invalid. So basically, play fair, essentially. But where it says, if the trustees do not answer in general or subordinate themselves, then consent has not been given. That is not true. We talk about the four the the rules of uh, presentments. When you let's see if I have time real quick. I know this one's going to be an hour. It's close to an hour. I'm sorry, but how to answer? A presentment PDF. Oh, lovely. Right at the top. Dishonor. Refusal. Default by remaining silent. Dishonor. Refusal. Argue the issues. You just waive jurisdiction. You just waive jurisdiction. This one is iffy. You wait. All of these technically waive jurisdiction. This one kind of doesn't. But you got to know the power behind it. Say, I agree to the terms of your summons upon proof of claim of it. You can challenge it within the terms of your conditional acceptance. You waived. I would never use this one. Unless you know exactly what you're doing. This is the this is the powerful one. That's the powerful one right there. But as you see, dishonor refusal is remaining um, silent. You don't want to do that. If you don't believe me, UCC 3-501, dishonor. Dishonor of a note is governed by the following rules. Basically, I'm not going to go through all of this, but basically, it's telling you like, if you don't answer, you're in dishonor. They're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna ding you for it. So don't, don't. That's not right. I'm telling you, that's not right because the code. Um, obviously, you're not subject to the code, but they're if they're if they're coming after you, they're going to they're gonna default you. 
Yeah, are you subject to that jurisdiction? No, but you should never, ever just not answer a suit. Don't do that. Don't do that. It's not smart. Continuing. And then last, minimum contacts. The trust must be... Per, 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 ah, the trust must purposely avail itself the benefits and services of the state, just like United States purposely... Sorry, United States citizen purposely and avail itself to benefits of the government. Social Security, welfare insurance, et cetera, et cetera, licensing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We'll not get into the diversity of citizenship here, though it is unholy important, that is, though it's wholly important to subject matter jurisdiction in the federal courts, for it is highly improbable that it would even be necessary to bring it up in such an action, given all the above with which the express trust is naturally armed. A good case to review regarding the rule of complete diversity is Strawbridge versus Court Curtis. We're not going to do that, but you should do that in your spare time. Um, basically, you're availing yourself to driver's license, to registering your car with the state and giving them the ownership over it. All of those things, contracting with the government, et cetera, et cetera. That's minimum contacts. They got you. Don't do that with your trust. Don't do it. Don't do it. This is why you become a secured party creditor, and you can do that, detach yourself from the straw man, and let your straw man continue to do those things, while you detach yourself as, as the flesh and blood man. This is not legal advice. This is information and educational purposes only. And with that note, we're going to shut it down, because I gotta use the bathroom, and I don't, I'm burned out. So, with that being said, I hope all of this was helpful. If you have any questions, remember, like, like share, subscribe, comment. Uh, follow us on Instagram, and then also um, give us some suggestions of anything that you think we can do better, any documents you may want us to cover, or any terms in general from this document that you might want us to cover. Long story short, when we talk about jurisdiction, always challenge it, always challenge it, always challenge it. Make them prove that they have jurisdiction over the private, because they don't. Make them, And if we're not talking about the private express trust, make them prove that they have jurisdiction over you because you were in that place or because they have subject matter or whatever make them prove it that being said